remember that there was no Hispanic identity when I was growing up. I've seen a lot of your public engagements where you identify as a Latina, but can you tell us what it means to be one to you? Um, <laughs> that's kind of a loaded question. There is no one experience for students of color at all. I was born in New York. So I'm from Nicaragua. I identify as a Black American or a Black Caribbean American. My mom is from Puerto Rico and my dad is from Jordan, but he's actually Palestinian. Hispanic identity didn't happen until the 1970s. We weren't declared a minority until 1977. Even though we were all Hispanic, we're all from different backgrounds. We, you know, some were born in our country, some, some of them were born here in the U.S. You're not talking about people having an identity as Latinos or Hispanics. I was a Nicaraguan immigrant. Kind of a Hispanic working class background, we'll say Mexican American and Chicano background. I'm Haitian, so I'm like, uh, I'm black and Latina. I'm a Latino and I'm gay. The way in which students, you know, experience their life was not as this sort of, you know, multicultural, one big old melting pot of identities. I came here in 1980, and this university, until a few years before that, was an all-white main institution. So a student was a man, and he was white. We had been discriminated against, but we could blend in, in a sense, you know, or I could blend in. It's an identity I own, but it's also an identity I know that um, is visible. I'm Latina, and I'm Dominican. I don't like the phrase Dominican American. Okay. I don't understand why. <laughs> I don't really like it. So, I don't identify as Latino. That's not my primary identification. I identify as a Dominican American. Latino is definitely a very political identity, and I don't adopt it very often, only in solidarity. Anybody who comes from South Florida um, and then ends up in a place at a predominantly white institution like UF is going to feel that their Latinidad is really highlighted um, in ways that perhaps it doesn't have to be in Miami because it's like the default. So I was 17, right? And I didn't know I was Latina until I came to live to the U.S. I, you know, in my head, I had never even heard the term, or like maybe heard the term, but not come to see myself as that. In regards to like a Latino identity or Latina identity, I didn't really... Like, I had one, but it was something that, like, I never felt that I needed to prove it because Gainesville has so many different, like, people and we're all really assimilated in Gainesville because of the university. Here I am something else, obviously, you know, like, no one told me, hi, you are an American, you know, like, every time I walked around, even though I actually was born in the U.S. But, so those things, you know, once I started reading about the histories, I just... I actually choose to identify myself as Latina because to me, it's this also whole sense of unity with all, you know, the other Latin American countries. So it wasn't until I came to UF that I felt that like people were challenging and being like, you don't speak Spanish, so you're not really Hispanic. There was just some discussion about the terms and Latino seemed for some people, and this is, this is true in other places as well, it, it's sort of more a more politically affirmative statement of identity than Hispanic. Not everybody wanted to embrace that term. Hispanic, of course, the arguments against it eliminates people of African descent and people of indigenous descent and etc. The thing is, we are not a one-trick pony. We are not all just one homogenized, you know, group of individuals. Frankly, my first impression of, of the campus was that it was a pretty lonely and isolating place. Whatever Latin community was there was um, primarily Cuban, but very few. And there were no support services. There was no 
special financial aid connected with uh, one uh, other uh, Latino student who um, who was also from Miami. We, we didn't know each other in Miami. We connected there, became very good friends. He ended up dropping out after one semester because he couldn't handle the the loneliness and the isolation. It was a very alien place. I had to uh, fit in to get in. You know what I mean? I had to fit in. But in 1980, there were still some traces of the past. Uh, so Hispanic students had to come and accommodate themselves to that established style. And many of them didn't feel welcome or felt at home in a big institution like this with that kind of a past. This campus really, since its inception, wasn't really meant for you and still struggles um, to make a space for students of color on campus. Going in and talking to my high school guidance counselor um, early in my senior year, and he asked me, what do you want to do, Paul, with your life? And I said, well, um, I'm getting all these college catalogs. This seems really exciting. What do you think? And I gave him the catalogs, and he looked at the catalogs. He looked at me, and he said, well, Paul, you know, college isn't for everyone. And he turned around and pulled out a nice brochure, and it said, be all you can be, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. And he said, this is, I think, what your future is going to be. And so, yes, I ended up in, enlisting in the Army for four years, not going to college, but that was my ticket into college. And if you look at most Chicano, I shouldn't say most, but many Chicano scholars, um, my age or older, you'll find that many of us are military veterans because frankly, that was the only way to get to higher education. If you grow up and your parents are working in, in building trades or agriculture or hospitality, chances are you have to have to move. Um, and very often you have to attend under-resourced schools and colleges. Not always, but very often they go to schools where the emphasis is not on learning, but the emphasis is on discipline and control. Because the idea is that we are going to be the soldiers, the fry cooks, the maids, the people who receive orders, not give orders. You know, it's not the fault of the University of Florida that society, that, that Florida is set up in such a way that Latino students and black students go to schools that are under-resourced, over-policed, under-educated, blah, 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 blah. But it is up to the University of Florida to create an educational environment where once you arrive in this campus, you have an equal opportunity to excel. Because nobody can tell us what we are or we're not if we know it. You know, UF has not done a really great job of documenting and celebrating and honoring what we've done as a community for UF. And so we felt that it was important for us to put it into practice. I knew that if I were just to continue to, to take the pen from their hand and write the story that they wanted to, we would be nowhere. So. You know, we, I, I took it to my community, I took it to our students, we took it to the streets, and we said to ourselves, we're writing this narrative for ourselves. Disregard the colonized history lessons that we've learned. Why don't we have a clear history that's told for us, by, for, and about us? We have histories being told about us from other people because oftentimes in textbooks, you don't hear about your own cultural revolutions, your own cultural leaders. The farm worker movement gave us the Chicano movement. Long before I was on the scene, you know, in the early mid sixties, if you were a Chicano Hispanic student and you, your parents sent you to college, you went to college, you kept your mouth shut. You didn't talk about identity. You didn't talk about heritage. You didn't have ethnic studies centers. You went to college to become mainstream, to become white, to lose your identity. In fact, leave your identity behind, leave it at the table. Don't learn Mexican history. Don't speak Spanish. Don't admire people of, of, of Mexican American descent or whatever country you came from, DR, El Salvador, whatever. You don't know that your group has had a major role in anything in like policy making or, you know, 
in history or advancement, technological advancements, advancement, anything like, you know, then you don't think, well, you know, I don't have any, if you don't have any knowledge, you come to believe, oh, maybe I'm not that important, you know, like maybe we, we don't contribute much to this bigger project. People who might come from other parts of the United States or they may have grown up in a place where they were already in a predominantly white environment and this was something that like stigmatized them so they rejected it. When I actually came to University of Florida I did not like identify as Latino um, and that's because my parents um, grew me up with this mentality that you are white. Now clearly when people look at me they don't think like I'm Anglo-Saxon like white Protestant like clearly like, um, they know I'm not Irish like <laughs> um, but like my family like they don't have like a college background they're like they're not educated in that traditional like um, sense but even they understood that like to be white in the United States is a lot better than being anything else so growing up with that idea of like being white like I am white I'm not Latino I'm not Hispanic I'm just white um, that was like kind of their way of saying like, just blend in and you'll have a better shot than we did or your brothers would have. When the farm workers went on strike in, in uh, Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, uh, man, it woke people up. And when they won a few victories, suddenly uh, being a Latino was not a shameful thing. It was like, wow. I'm brown, I'm proud, you know, because we're starting to get some victories here. That's why I always say that uh, Latino studies at the base of it is, is a working class movement. Suddenly you're sitting in that classroom and you're, you're 19 years old and you're like, I'm tired of the professor saying we don't have a history. And so I'm going to follow the example of my brothers and sisters in the fields, get together with some of my fellow students, and we're going to go on strike until my college or university develops a... Chicano Studies program. It's more complicated than that. Yeah. <laughs> but in a broad outlines, that's how we got the programs that we, we now have, especially out west, in the Midwest, in the Northeast. Now, the South was a slightly, slightly different story. Now, that was a, an interesting place at the time. As I said, in New York, there had long been, you know, uh, Puerto Rican studies and same thing in the, in the Southwest and Texas. But Florida, despite its Cuban population there. There were Cuban studies, but there wasn't a push for Latino studies, and in part I think it had to do with the way um, the Cuban community didn't always identify with uh, other Latino groups in the country. Growing up in Miami, you think that our education would be filled with perhaps the premises of Latin American studies? That wasn't the case. I always learned the same thing every year. And if I wanted to learn more, it was more of like, oh, ask your parents or ask your family about culture. And that's the only way I really learned by talking with my family, not necessarily a teacher telling me, hey, this is what they do in other countries. It was always the basics, always stuff that you could Google, but not real like meat and potatoes of history. What happened in New York and in, um, in the Southwest with all the activism that brought Chicano Studies classes and, and Puerto Rican Studies classes, that was back in the early 70s so that was already you know it had its history and in fact some of those programs were already starting to suffer from attrition you know that they universities were trying to you know wrap them up into some other program or you know they weren't hiring and replacing people so you know in that way you know UF you know it, it, it wasn't completely out of sync with what was not going on in other universities elsewhere in the United States. I mean, I'm, I'm Latina, and I was aware of the dearth of classes of scholarship on U.S. Latinos. Now, of course, I knew that there was uh, a scholarship in Chicano studies and Puerto Rico studies, but I landed in Florida for my first job in 1989, and I was in the Center for Latin American Studies there. There were no courses on U.S. Latinos at that moment at the University of Florida. Here at UF, actually, the Center for Latin American Studies was um, the first center in the nation that focused in Latin America. The center, as of now, it's been stronger in Latin American studies, but not in Latino studies. So I had a roommate, her name was Livia Rodriguez, she was a graduate student here. And Livia um, was amazing, I mean she just had this very clear 
um, notion about the fact that Latinos, in at least in the state of Florida, that there was a huge Latino population. Mm -hmm. But then when you came to one of the best schools that the state has to offer, it didn't mirror the population mm -hmm. of the state. And as a public institution, that was troubling. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, Livia used to say when we, got, when we started sort of getting more and more involved, she always used to say, look, there are so many different types of Latinos in Florida and in the U.S. that if we're going to try to even pretend that we can speak about one culture, which is hard in and of itself, we got to educate ourselves and know what the heck we're talking about. So we made it a point of really educating ourselves about what does it mean to be Latino in the United States? Who are the different types of Latinos in the United States? And what are the issues that were affecting the Latin? How did we get, like, how did this all happen? It was first on our own. So Livia would like suggest readings, like, you know, different types of books that I started reading. Um, and then there was, as, as momentum grew and more things started happening for Latino students, we worked very closely with um, a professor, Deborah Pacini, at the Center for Latin American Studies. And so she then decided, since there were enough students that were sort of like, you know, trying to figure what does it mean to be Latino in the United States, she actually did a seminar for one year on Latinos in the U.S. And so we flocked to her class wanting to really understand. I, you know, offered a course that students, you know, could get some sense of the history of Latinos and the, the history of, uh, you know, the different communities you know, the, the, the Mexican-Americans, the Puerto Ricans, and the Cubans primarily. I mean, that, as far as I know, was the first class that offered history, social, cultural history of Latinos. Then we had a visiting professor from California, and she did a whole class on Chicano studies. And so we, like, sat through that class. Nina, Nina Menendez. Okay. Nina Menendez is a, was a professor of Romance languages. She was a Spanish professor. They really didn't have a lot in the way of programs oriented toward those, those students. You know, the kind of programs that I was used to seeing in California at the universities there, uh, where there were ethnic studies programs and Latino studies programs in place, I was able to convince the chair of the department and other people in the Spanish department to let me develop a course, um, Introduction to Latino Studies. You know, it was a class about uh, Latinos in, you know, throughout U.S. history. And we went back and, you know, we talked about Cesar Chavez and we talked about the Puerto Ricans in New York and the suit suits in Chicago. So it was a really cool, like, you know, sort of like, this is your history in the U.S. You didn't just come here in 1980 from Cuba and then your history started. It was an elective, uh, it was no prerequisites or anything. And um, it was very popular right away. We had at least 60 or 70 students sign up for the first semester. We kind of held each other accountable in the sense of like, no, you can't just open your mouth mm -hmm. and talk unless you really knew what you were talking about when you were talking about Latino students or Puerto Rican issues or whatever the different thing was. And so I learned so much about Latin American history and culture by being here and wanting to educate myself so that I could better understand the dynamics mm -hmm. of the different Latinos here. She was, I think, very instrumental in helping to sort of expand our knowledge and expand our interest in activism mm -hmm. and, and in you know, uh, understanding where you come from and why it's important to know your history and to remain active in the university setting like this so that you know you are counted and you are seen and that your history is taught and you're accounted for and that you're different and that you add to the mix and it's a good addition. Now obviously the more Latinos you have on, on the faculty then the more you know they can advocate for you know additional hires in areas where there's holes. Not only is there a recruitment issue for diverse faculty and staff, it's a retention issue. I still felt, felt very much as, you know, in the minority. And I mean, the reason why we organized the, the few faculty that were there and the staff into the association for Hispanic faculty and staff is to try to advocate to provide more support and include 
uh, not only Latino uh, students, but Latino faculty and staff, because we were also isolated. And other than the association we had created ourselves, there was no community around, nothing that would bring the faculty together and kind of celebrate the accomplishments and recognize the special needs of, well, not just students, but faculty. People of color, just like women in general, you know, how to be double, how to work double to legitimize, legitimize their position. You know, like that they deserve to be there, that they not only got that job because of affirmative action, which I'm so sick of hearing since I attended, you know, undergraduate school. People double guessing, why are you here? You know, I look at the people who mentor me, you know, people like Carlos Munoz. He was one of the founders of, you know, the UC Berkeley Ethnic Studies program. Carlos, you know, was a Vietnam vet. I mean, he came back to the U.S., when he started Chicano Studies, there was no curriculum. I mean, they had to create a curriculum in the late 60s, early 70s. And they had an uphill fight the whole way. I mean, they all worked in doing prison education, community outreach. I mean, but that's how they developed this curriculum that makes it possible for us to have these programs today. And um, so I would be embarrassed, humiliated, if I, you know, Carlos called me one day and he said, well, Paul, I, I don't see you being involved in, in the DREAM Act or comprehensive immigration reform. What's going on? You know, that's an extra expectation that faculty uh, of color have, but that's one that we have to continue to, to accept, I believe, because the situation of our students and our communities is so dire. Uh, sometimes I feel like we're, we're so alone. I remember when we started with Hispanic Heritage Month, they had a retreat, and also a lot of things the students told me on my, my e-board that they feel very, very alone here sometimes. Like, they don't have adults to lean out to. They don't have mentors. I've been very fortunate to find, find them, but I think a lot of the students don't. And that's very sad because you need these students that are undergraduates to feel support, that people care about them, because those are the ones that are going to keep going. And then I think sometimes they get involved in other things that sound where their true passion lies because they don't have that mentorship. They don't have those people that really care about them, and that's sad. But needless to say, I did face a lot of difficulties, um, not only in terms of like difficulties in classes, but in terms of finding help. The University of Florida does have some Hispanic Latino faculty, but it's not enough. You can't have 20, 30 students be assigned to one faculty member to mentor. Like it just, it doesn't work that way. Like the university needs to do a better job of recruiting diverse faculty and staff so that students have someone whom they can talk to and whom they can, you know, relate to. Because it's different. When you have someone you can relate to, who knows, who's been where you've been, who knows what your struggles are, who shares some common history, some common heritage, their words carry so much more weight, so much more. Rodriguez. Um, so I'm from Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I went to the University of Florida to do my master's uh, in urban and regional planning. So I, I graduated actually in 1997. There was a lot of divisions amongst the Latinos, and we were pretty much fighting each other rather than building relationships. Back then, we were a lot of little groups. So it wasn't that everyone was Hispanic, you know, we had WIPA, which was the Puerto Ricans. We had the the law students, you know, class. We had uh, HSBA. We had, you name it, there existed. So we decided out of that to create a Hispanic Latino Student Council. And one of the proposals of the Hispanic Latino Student Council had to do with the need to create the Institute of Hispanic Latino Cultures. So it became a banner. Uh, and uh, I recall that the relationship with the, with the university administration was a little bit tense at the time as well because of, of the lack of recognition of the importance of inserting these issues in the, in the university policy agenda. We began to build a coalition of uh, interested faculty and students that advocated for the creation of Macasita. There was another person um, that was also very instrumental. Her name was Minerva Casaña Simon, and he was at the Student Affairs Office. 
And so she was very, really interested in giving Latino students a voice. And so whenever she would see Latino students getting involved, she really tried to support them and counsel them and, and throw resources their way as much as possible so that it could be not just a few people, but sort of like institution building. So soon after I arrived, I also learned about the interest of having an institute, which became out of a quality of life task force. Uh, I was a member of the task force. Well, the charge was to understand and evaluate what the quality of life issues were because we had had a spate of, of uh, racist incidents on campus and it was a lot of tension. At that time in 1990, there were protests on campus, both the African American community and now the growing Latino community, the uneasy with the lack of support, lack of infrastructure to, to help those populations. It was a pivotal moment because at, at that point we were beginning to have a growth in awareness on the Hispanic and Latino issues for the campus. At the time we were barely one or two percent of the student population. And, uh, you know, the state population was more along the lines of uh, 7, 8 percent, and so we were very severely underrepresented. And the goal was to look at the issues deeply and then write a report and we'll have recommendations for the university. And uh, one of the recommendations that came out of that task force was to create La Casita, a center for Hispanic uh, students. Clearly, one, it was a number of about needs that the students were seeking to be to meet and the institute was one of the recommendations and so the students soon after I arrived started coming to me and asking about if you know are we going to get an institute this and that <laughs> uh, and it became you know it started uh, racing and becoming more of uh, an activism uh, situation rather than a formal petition process it was more an advocacy across the board so we we had many students uh, engaged. They were going to get uh, um, papers and have students sign their name and you know so on. I said that is non-effective. You're going to show up with four or five pages of, of signatures. That doesn't make a statement. I said how about if you do individual petitions and you show up with a box of petitions. <laughs> we had just just raw advocacy. So we were it was a, a Latino students that really cared about it that went step forward and, and made the, the, the right calls, uh, run for office, get involved, get the name out, get the issues out at every forum. Livia and some other students, they started building relationships with students from the Institute of Black Culture, with student government, Women's Center, different places. They started creating coalitions and, and telling them, look, we really want your support on this. I recall that uh, as part of this, we started, you know, uh, holding alliances with women's groups and LGBT community, which at the time and the basis of discrimination against the LGBT community were extremely serious in Gainesville as well. I was a Hispanic student back then, but I was also a gay man and I wasn't always out so I came out after my first semester so there was a whole Hispanic thing going on but there was also the whole LGBT thing going on at the same time. There were gay Latinos on campus mm -hmm. and there were gay Latino professors on campus. I mean we were gay and lesbian in 1992, 93, 94 that I was here where the Greeks dominated the student union and the Greek council decided on funding of student groups. And, you know, so there was always the issues of having to go, you know, being gay, lesbian, and having to go before the student council to ask for money. And, you know, um, it was pretty, it was pretty scary and it was pretty difficult. So there was always that, there was always, um, you know, so there was always that movement also to make sure that people understood that, you know, we were oppressions on, on campus as well. And, you know, that it wasn't just white gay men, but there were, you know, there were blacks and there were Asians and there were Hispanics. So it was, so all of that was going on while I was here. We really had to do a lot of organizing and uh, work and meetings and, you know, we would go to a meeting with an administration official and they would say, trepal barbaridades about Latinos, you know, like, uh, and then we would, we would have to publish those uh, and make it public, you know, the, whatever slurs they would use to refer to Latinos. So we would start pointing them out as well and going into student government and student senate and saying such and such persons making these, these statements about Latino students, this is unacceptable, you know, and trying 
to, to share light, shed light on the mentality of many of the administrators at the time regarding the Latino population, you know. Some of these administrators would make, uh, you know, expressions regarding, oh, Latinos, they should, they don't face discrimination, they're not from the United States, they should go back to their countries, you know, that type of, of statements uh, with a total disregard uh, to the history of the state of Florida, for example, itself, no? Uh, so, so they would try to mix the issue of the Latino experience with the immig immigration issue as well, uh, and try not to validate the fact that there had been many Latinos living in the States for generations, no? And uh, so that was part of, of the conversation as well. In terms of students, it was really a small group of students that put this in paper and pushed it forward. And then at that point, what sort of became apparent was this notion that like, look, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. this is a political process. And it's gonna be about how much support we can get both from the inside and from the outside mm -hmm. for this thing to be happened. Because we knew that what we were asking for was big. Mm -hmm. The university had never in a million years expected or thought or would want to do this on their own. Mm -hmm. This had to come from a pressure point. So it came to a point in which we had to refer to people outside of UF for support, not only the Latino community in Florida, uh, in other places in Florida, but also uh, we reached out to uh, uh, national uh, organizations such as La Raza, the National Council of La Raza, who intervened in the process uh, uh, on behalf of the Latino students. We, we, we sent letters and calls and to Tallahassee, Washington, D.C. We, we reached out to national civil rights organizations like the National Puerto Rican Coalition and the National Council of La Raza, LULAC. I mean, we just wrote the world and we said, look, we're fighting for this and we want you to support us on it. And they did. They started writing letters to the president saying, we understand that you guys are thinking about this and we want you to know that as you know national civil rights organization like we're in full support of this and that you should really do this because we would present the case like look at the number of students in the state of florida look at the number of students at the university of florida we're the top university in the state not enough students not enough support so we kind of really did our homework and try to package it together and so it got people's attention and they're starting writing letters september 23rd i think it was the date dr sandin shows up at my office i'm like oops i must be in trouble <laughs> And he closed the door, and I said, oh, <laughs> this is the first and only time he closed the door. And so I said, very uh, quiet and, you know, just very sweet. And what can I do for you? <laughs> he says to me, I bring you good news. So I kind of, you know, perked up. I said, oh, good news is good news. So I really, to be honest with you, I did not think that this was it. But he said, you got your institute. I said, what? I mean, you could imagine my elation. I was just like b beside myself inside, but I'm trying to act cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then he said, but you can't tell no one until we make it official. Okay. The administration, well, we, they gave us a really hard time. We gave them hell in many instances, but, but in the end, they, they came through and they came through because I guess that they realized, you know, the power of Latinos beyond the university and what they, what that would entail to them if we made out of this a national issue. So I guess that they realized that they really had to fall through. Uh, and that, uh, and I guess, again, that this letter from National Council of La Raza saying we're watching what you're doing, it really was instrumental in the process. And so we put proposals together and we sent it to, um, to the university administration to say, this is what we want this place to be. But we really had to work hard at defining what that was, the concept itself. There was an Institute of Black Culture, right? So we would borrow from that concept of what the Institute of Black Culture was. But, but we really were trying to figure out what does it mean to us and what do we want it to be? We call it the Institute of Hispanic Latino and we said cultures purposely because we wanted the community at large understand that we were a conglomerate of people with different, somewhat diverse backgrounds. When we put the proposal together, we wanted somebody with a PhD because understand we didn't want it to be called a cultural center. 
we wanted an institute. And the purpose of that was because it was more than a place to gather and have festivities and music and food. It was a place to educate people, to do seminars, to do workshops, to educate the community at large so they get to know who we were. Because it wasn't about being insular and us, all about us. It was about sharing our culture with others, working with the black community. Because obviously in our diaspora, we had every member of the race. So understanding those things, we saw a bigger thing. We wanted a research center, a place of depository of all the history of Hispanics in the state of Florida. That was part of the ambition that we had for La Casita. At La Casita, I was always like, we could do something else. Because at that time, I remember what I saw at least, it was all about like food and music and you know, the, the wonderful things of our culture. But I, I personally, I wanted to see a little bit more of the politics, the art, you know, the literature that comes from our language and our identity and is so beautiful and you can pair it up to, you know, the big names anywhere. And so I had this idea of um, creating a night um, where people can come and share poetry and discuss a topic. In Spanish we would call it tertulias. It's basically for, you know, intellectual, artistic, academic movement and then and you just gather and you share ideas, you drink a little bit of coffee and it's fun. And I would walk like to all the departments at school and talk to the professors, you know, invite the professors so they can come and, and talk to us about whatever is it that they want to talk about. I remember um, Avellaneda, I think he was one of the professors at the uh, Spanish department. He was a student of Jorge Luis Borges. And he came and gave a talk, um, you know, and, and the format was you have the talk, you have a Q&A, and then people, if people wanted to sing or play an instrument or share something, they had the floor and, you know, you have cookies and coffee and, you know, Spanglish all over the place and it was fun. And I really thought that it was going to be something very small, um, but it got to the point that it got quite big. I mean, we were counting numbers and I remember the highest was up, up to the hundreds, like on Wednesday night at La Casita in that little space we had, you know, 80, 100 people. It's not just social. It's not just a community space. I think there's, you know, sort of academic aspects to it. When I got here, I met Dr. Ortiz, I met Professor Guerra, I met Dr. Castillo. So seeing what they do with their lives and that they're these great, amazing professors and they're so smart and they love their students so much, but that they're also advocates for their community. And seeing that having a degree is not just me reading a lot of books and writing papers. No, having a degree means I have a purpose to serve to my community. We wanted to create a library to be created like a depository of information and literature and research and so on. At the time, I mean, Florida had the third and most important library of Latin America. It had the Center for Latin American Studies, but again, the focus of the center was to do research regarding Latin American cultures. Nobody was looking or talking about the Latino experience within the U.S. Even though Florida had 13% of its population at the time from Latino descent, it was, I guess, the fourth largest state with Latino population at the time, but in they, at the University of Florida, which is the public university, uh, those issues were not discussed, not taught, not dissected. Uh, and we felt that it, it, there was a, a void there. One of the things that we wanted to see happen as part of this process of creating La Casita and all of that was that we could actually develop a program of Latino studies because we had a great center for Latin American studies, but there was no Latino studies. And there's a big difference between those two. And so we were trying to push for that, but it unfortunately never got off the ground. There's history behind all this, and students don't know it until they expose themselves to it. But if they don't have the opportunity to expose themselves, how else will they learn? How else will we have more cultural spaces? How else will we have a better understanding of all sorts of walks of life here on campus? Working with the recruitment office and then working with the student affairs office, you start listening about how Latino students in high schools get canceled out and they don't take the right courses so that then they don't have their credits to come to college. Well, why is that? Uh, then you start hearing about the students that do come in, but then they, you know, they end up leaving. Mm -hmm. well, why is that? 
you know, and so you start, you really, I, we started getting a glimpse sort of the behind the scenes about, you know, if I only would have gone off of my experience, well, my experience was a privileged one. Mm -hmm. But I knew fairly soon that that wasn't a lot of people's experience. And so when you started realizing kind of what the patterns were, you couldn't help but to say there's something wrong here. Students will come to me and say, I've never heard anybody telling me that I have a funny accent. Mm -hmm. And suddenly that's an issue here. I was told that I was too Hispanic for my own good. Whenever I wanted to do something that was different, it's like, are you sure? Is that what you really want to do? Because, you know, not a lot of Hispanic people are involved in that and so on and so forth. When I was an undergrad, in that university crowd corner where the Krishnas call and, and sing. Sometimes the Ku Klux Klan will go to the, would be on the other side of the, the, the street, you know, with their hoods and their things, and they would be protesting. So it was scary. <laughs> but in one side you'll see the Ku Klux Klan, and then in the other side you'll see the Krishnas, you know, like <laughs> counterbalancing that dynamic. and. Um, but like to tell you, right, it was 2000. One of the newer ambassadors um, came in one day and said that somebody in his residence hall screamed at him to speak English because he was talking to his mom on the phone in Spanish. And he, I think he was a freshman. Yeah, he was in the dorm, so yeah, he was a freshman before he moved out. He came into the house and told us that story and we're like, what the heck, like that's not okay, blah, 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 right? When I first came to UF, there were two things. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of incidents of sexual assault and then there was there were actually a lot of um, suicides on campus. Oh. I don't know if you heard about those, but it was actually scary. There was a, a year, I think it was my freshman or my sophomore year, where there was a suicide every month for the first semester, mm -hmm. for fall. Gil, um, who is Hispanic Latino, ran for um, president of student government. During the whole election process going, somebody wrote on the walls of La Casita, um, some not very pleasant um, racial um, words, and that created um, kind of this whole movement of, you know, um, awareness. The night that we won the executive ticket and the majority of Senate seats, um, there was only two people, one person from the other party who congratulated me, and then another person who came up to me and said, I would watch your back if I were you. We knew that we wanted this to be a home away from home for Latino students. And we put that in writing. We put it in the proposal that, that this is going to be the home away from home for Latino students. When you look at a lot of what was being said, and maybe there's some research that backs this up, there's always been this notion that Latino students don't go away far away to college because mm -hmm. they don't want to be far away from family. Mm -hmm. And so we said, look, if you're serious about attracting Latino students to come or study here, you need to offer a place where it's going to be their home away from home. And that's going to be a key retention issue for you to keep these students here. So I clearly remember the first time coming into La Casita. At the door, every time you come in, they're like, welcome to La Casita, and you don't get that anywhere else. So then what I really liked was oh, you walk in at the at one side is the ambassadors and like the little desk and everything. And on the other side, it literally looked like a living room. You had like the coffee maker, a whole bunch of plates, coffee pot, everything. And then you had the living room and nice couches, full on TV. You had a little game station a little living room behind the living room, a fully functional kitchen in the back. The kitchen on the second floor, there were some meeting rooms and there was a larger conference room, but it never felt corporate, it never felt institutional, mm -hmm. it felt really like a casita. It would make a difference if you go into a space that resembles a home as opposed to an office. It was really a space where everybody can come, come together and interact and speak Spanish. I think for me, it was, it was when you went there, especially if I had a student who had just at the beginning of the year, the academic year, to bring them there, to introduce them, and to have activities where all the students came together and we could just listen to what the stories were, and what they were going through, the adjustment period, the culture shock. For us, we talked to our abuelita or tia or something in the table con el cafecito and it's an intimate relationship where you really talk about your things. And here we had a counseling center that was forcing us to go see a stranger and tell them very intimate things and to us it was horrifying. And so the institute became a place where the students will come in and we were the bridge to the counseling center. 
the counseling center will send somebody to talk about certain issues and then the, the students will meet them over a lunch or brown bag or something and then we created the intimacy that was needed for the student to feel safe to be going over there and talk about whatever issues rape or whatever things it's, it's you know where we cook or we eat where we sleep where we study i will never forget that um one of my professors he was mentioning a book and I go like, you know, and nobody in the class was responding. And I go, oh, you know, it's Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. And he was like, oh, it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but I wouldn't expect someone like you to know it. And I remember that I went to La Casita and I just felt, you know, just walking in, felt so much better about myself. So it was nice that I had some place to fit in, but it wasn't until maybe like, the end of the semester where we started as a staff, like having more meaningful conversations about like identity. And that's when within the staff, I started hearing like, oh, you don't speak Spanish. So like you don't belong. So that that's kind of inspired me to try to push La Casita to be more inclusive because, you know, there's students who might walk in and you don't know if they hear you say that and they might never come back and they might be Hispanic and Latino. It was also for me, I think, a, a space for a lot of growth um, because you're exposed to so many different like cultures and diaspora within Latin America, like just in that house. You don't know what combination of students you're going to have and, you know, maybe they're like, maybe they're, say, exactly the same as me, but they were raised in like a more like Middle Eastern dominant culture and they want to connect and then if you hear that, you're not going to want to come in. So I just think that like that's important because you know you can as an individual contribute even if you don't have the language which is obviously important like god i wish i spoke spanish and i just took it for five years and i'm just horrible but you know like there's other ways that somebody can contribute to their community and be meaningful and i don't want them to be shut out i along with other ambassadors of lgbt affairs created like a discussion group uh, based for LGBT and Latinx individuals because it is so hard because of the machismo that is present that I really wanted to be a space where people could discover both and not have one or the other, how it is oftentimes in that Latinx culture. People really spoke from their hearts and they talked about issues like, you know, skin color, uh, hair straightening, um, and how these issues impact families, you know, issues of, uh, you know, my parents think I'm too dark or they don't like the fact that I have, you know, wavy, curly hair, you know. And, and so we had a really wonderful discussion about these issues that are currently uh, defining us, but also sometimes holding us back unless we can bring them out into into the open. Uh, and when I tell my colleagues, uh, some of you know, my white peers, they'll say, well, I, that, that was back in the 50s or 60s. I say, no, that's now. That that's now. I mean, we're grappling with these same types of issues, but it's a new generation, and they are having to deal with this as people, you know, in their late teens, early twenties. And that's one of the many reasons why La Casita is a critical place because it provides a safe space to talk about, you know, ourselves as I, um, as professionals, as individuals, as family members of a larger kind of Hispano Latino diaspora, which has specific very complicated histories which aren't well understood in the broader academic world. One of the reasons not only it had to do with attracting and making sure that there was a retention of Latino students that they could have a place to hang out and just you know be themselves and, and discuss the issues that they were facing at the time but also a place where to uh, organize around the issues uh, that were affecting Latino students at the time and the wider Latino community. If it wasn't for you know um, you know, students campaigning social awareness and social justice, those houses would just never be in existence. Now that the outreach is there, now that the education piece is there, and now that, you know, we know that we can do what we learned, um, how do we now take it into the next step? Hello, my name is Dr. Eric Castillo. I'm the director of the Institute of Hispanic Latino Cultures, also known as La Casita. When I used to be the GA there, Eric Castillo was the, the director, Dr. Castillo, and he was great. I mean, he 
inspire all the students. He inspired me. To this day, we're good friends. Um, we created, you know, like we started this project about nuestras historias to like show the stories of Latino students and alumni and stuff. I remember that he would make us call him Dr. Castillo because that doctor before the Castillo is so important. It makes students realize that, hey, I can get a PhD. My time there, I would say, probably was really, was very heavily focused on advocacy and social justice work. And I think that prior to me, it was really, it was a groundswell of like educational work and, and more of like the social work, social, you know, social life for students. Um, but my goal was to really ramp up that social justice work. Eric definitely, you know, brought the whole national piece. I mean, he has brought the whole immigration issues at hand and, and all that. But, you know, I, I don't want to see that die. I, I don't want to see the Institute go backwards. I mean, we did that right away from the Drop the I Word campaign, ca collecting pennies for farm workers, UI, um, CIW, student farm, work, student farm worker actions. <clears throat> so we've always, I think that is what I remember the most is just that was always the forefront. And we got a lot of pushback on that at the very beginning. You know, students just weren't very excited about that. They didn't understand. They didn't want to participate. They wanted everything to be hoof fun fiesta. And <clears throat> It took time to get them to understand the value of that. But I think when we, when we really focused it on undocumented youth, that became very prevalent because it was very real. Because students, we, students in fraternities and sororities were undocumented. You know, this was before DACA. And so they, had, they realized that they had brothers and sisters in the sororities and fraternities that were directly impacted. So I think as we brought them in to share their stories, that, that made the necessity of activism much more of a reality and a necessity. So, and I think after a while, I think people just knew La Casita to be the place of activism. I mean, even the other centers like IBC, you know, LGBT Affairs and APIA, everybody just knew that we were that groundswell for it. And it was, that was like a really a big point of pride for me. We've done a trip to Immokalee, Florida, which has one of the highest percentage of migrant workers um, here in Florida and also one of the, um, cities with the highest poverty rates and we, we did a trip uh, last year to to learn about like the community and um, the migrants in the Makali and how they live so that we can better facilitate like how we advocate for them and like understand where they come from so that we can work towards where we want to be in the future. La Casita has been one of like the main proponents um, for the tuition equity movement on campus. We think that you know, everyone deserves like the equal uh, equal access to education and these students are having to pay four times as much just for tuition alone it is ridiculous. We're trying to pass and save tuition for undocumented students and it's a movement that started this semester with, with uh, many student organizations on campus coming together to fight and demand administration to pass this uh, policy that's already been passed at FIU and Miami Days. Where there are like not that many undocumented students. Um, they don't see themselves um, market, you know, enough within this university. And they are brave enough to go up to an administrator and say, hey, I'm undocumented or I have DACA. What does that mean? This is school. Administration needs to know what that means. It shouldn't be up to the student to go chase 100 administrators to find out the truth. It should be up to each department to teach themselves um, you know, what these things mean, okay, well, you have DACA, so then you have out-of-state tuition, but you, have, you can fill out this waiver, um, which is really simple. Um, administration just has to take the step to care to learn. Um, when I went in, little me, it's the first time going to Casita, crying because I didn't know what was going on with my tuition. It was very comfortable to be able to know that these students were on my side. I had a whole building dedicated to students like myself. Um, so it was very comforting and Casita was definitely the place that we would go where when we needed meetings, when we needed to like, you know, meet as a whole, when we needed to meet other undocumented students, it was a, it's, it's a safe space that was not really a UF building, you know, the fact that it looked like a home made it feel more like a home. Um, and the fact that, you know, it's not in the right union like Salita definitely helps because it's not like we have an administration looking at us when we have our meetings, especially when they're about activism. That was the process, you know, you first outreach, then you educate, 
And then once you've educated, how do you now bring it forth? So when I found out that La Casita was going to be torn down, like it personally upset me. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the people who told me, you know, they were like, no, 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 it's good because actually the place is like condemned. Like, you know, like it's falling apart. It needs um, to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. It's going to be a good thing. Um, I've seen the plans. They're going to rebuild it. But, uh, you know, like I have faith in this system. I got here fall 2014 and it had been, it had just finished the little um, renovation, which all they did was like paint it and put in new flooring um, and maybe for some furniture. But some of us in the committee knew about that. And we brought it up and basically how, why are these houses being condemned all of a sudden if they were just inspected a couple of years ago? Yeah, Elise was actually the one who told me about that because um, she was here for the remodeling. And she was like, why are they condemning it now? If they Supposedly they just went through a whole thing. Ever since I was an ambassador, people told me, just wait, UAF wants to do something with these spaces. Like, La Casita won't be out that long or anything. Um, and slowly but surely, like, I would hear things like, oh, yeah, like, they're taking funds away from La Casita or anything. So that way, the UAF can just be like, okay, bye-bye, and just put something new. So then when I heard about the Mosaic Culture space, I was like, wait, what is happening? I'm Chad Chavira. Um, I'm working with No La Abisita. Um, we put this on here because the MCDA committee is trying to create a U-shaped building which would combine um, La Casita and IBC, which are the Black Culture Building and the Hispanic Latino Culture Building. We are opposed to that plan because those buildings in and of themselves have very rich history and we believe that the U-shape would erase that culture, homogenize our experiences, and really just make it less safe for marginalized students at UF. The administrators who have been pushing the assembly space in the middle have been saying that people need a space to meet. Um, that's not what the original intent of these buildings were. The students who fought for them did not say that they wanted a reception hall. <laughs> Nobody asked for that. So, in the 1980s, we saw the language of multiculturalism co op you know, and it was it was whitewashed. We saw that in the 21st century again in academia and in higher ed, even corporate world. The, the corporatization of multiculturalism and diversity and inclusion, where they whitewash it such a, to a degree that it doesn't mean it has no justice value anymore. It literally returns to the sort of food fund fiesta. You know, I, I think that UF probably found it more palatable for us to talk about things in terms of multiculturalism. And that's by and large because the, the experience of UF is largely black and white. You know, and so it wasn't until, you know, until places like La Casita and um, Latin American studies started to really gain momentum and authority and exercise power on you know, that university that we started to really see in the browning of, of UF. Cultural centers are being converted into multicultural centers across the country. My neighbor actually goes to the university, to Northwestern University, and um, their Multicultural and Diversity Affairs Department tried to move in different cultural um, offices into their black house, which is our equivalent of the IBC. Students protested there, and they put the project on pause because there was a lot of backlash because of the dilution of their space, and it's no longer a safe space for black students specifically. And that project is actually on pause. There are a lot of directors and people involved in this kind of work across the country who fear that these spaces are being erased. During my time when I was there, absolutely, there were conversations about a, a more multicultural space. You know, I, we, we, we went back and forth a lot between us wanting to maintain our identity as directors of cultural spaces and also introducing this concept of us as assistant directors of a multicultural office. And, you know, we, we had different leadership at the time that really wanted us to pronounce and articulate our multicultural identity more as professionals. But we knew that the way in which students, you know, experienced their life was not as this sort of, you know, multicultural one big old melting pot of identities. 
Um, the University of Illinois administration tried to um, create another multicultural center and actually two of our directors under Multicultural and Diversity Affairs come from a university, the University of Illinois, where they shut down their La Casita and they built a multicultural center. What's to say that in 20, 30 years, it's just another MCDA area where you have a space for all the different communities. Mm -hmm. so. When you look at like the history of like getting the IBC, um, there are students that came here um, um, that were arrested, expelled, you know, that fought for this. And then just like merging it and like I feel like we'll erase all that history. So it's like merging the buildings, it's like I feel like um, I guess throwing down the whole history and then like having like a whole new issue which I'm like very um, I guess worried about like what is 20 years from now will they know what the IBC or the La Casita stand for. I think that issue was complicated for me from the start because there's people on both sides like people I knew who were like sure the only way that we can get these houses is to have it combined and let's do it and other people who I also knew were like no we need to keep them separate. The overarching theory mm -hmm. is that they wanted this one multicultural building and that's why they would finesse or make up these numbers that's why they would make up this um, argument for solidarity so mm -hmm. if you put all people of color in one building that's solidarity yeah. apparently <laughs> they called it that they said it was a proverbial shaking of hands mm -hmm. by having that little space connecting the IBC and La Casita they came up with all these argu arguments in favor of their design and our, we interpreted it as they want this design no matter what. Yeah, you would combine IBC and La Casita, but then it would become the MCDA house and then the actual individual structures of IBC and La Casita would be lost over time. Like, no one would then remember that IBC and La Casita were two standalone structures, and people then would be like, oh, this is MCDA's house. And I think a lot of students were scared of that. And I wouldn't blame them because verbal assurances aren't, um, that's, that's never enough. If it's one building, it's, it's easier to convert into something else in the future whereas now there are two separate buildings and they're going to have very distinct designs so it's going to be harder for them to be converted into an academic or an office space if it's designed differently when you're like the only one out of a group of 10 people you don't want to say something is wrong because you already know it's that can be bad and at the same time even if it's your own people even if it's like all oh, same people of my same race and everything it was even more disheartening because they're on your own familia but then at the same time, it's just what do you stand for and what do you want your next people to look at and then what did the people before you fight for? Because at the end of the day, like, it wasn't, we didn't do this just to disrespect whatever struggle the founders of La Casita and especially ABC mm -hmm. had in creating these spaces. It would have been a dishonor to just let it go. So I feel like the parallel is to that underrepresented minority within the minority group, that person who isn't a traditional leader or isn't involved in as many things as, as the other popular kids. Like mm -hmm. you still have a voice, you still can create something new. You just have to find like the other people because you still need your support here and there. Mm -hmm. But then to just not really give up, I think it's that traditional Latino story. Tell me the difference between place and space. The difference between place and space is that place making is something that becomes active process of the people through their activities, their interactions, their emotions, their memories, all of the things they're going to do. What makes spaces special is when we turn them into places. I know that we can turn the new La Casita into a place just as well. But it's up to all of you to pay it forward, right? To bring more people, to keep saying the ways in which this was meaningful to you, and to make sure that you keep us the task because the students come and go. This place was born of fire and activism. I was on this campus when there was no student for president painted on this thing. We are entering the climate that feels worse than it did in 2001, to be perfectly honest with you. And it is up to us to say no apologies, won't back down, and to make this space as safe, but as vocal as it has always been. Whatever we as students decide to do now is what will determine the future for La Casita.
So if as students we want to protect the space that exists here at UF, then you will see La Casita in the next 20 years. But if we remain complacent with the issues that we see in our daily lives as students and not only as faculty, then there will be no future for La Casita. But that is why we are here as students to fight for that space and to make sure that in the next 10 years, students can also fight for that space and students can also have the same feelings and the same encounters that I've had as a student here at UF.